Let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to a special Saturday edition uh, of uh, uh, the Cobb Institute's offerings. I'm Matt Siegel. Uh, I chair the Science Advisory Committee here at the Cobb Institute. And today I'm very excited uh, to welcome Aaron Gare, who uh, many of you know, that's why you're here. He's an Australian philosopher and associate professor in philosophy and cultural inquiry at Swinburne University. Um, as you've heard a little bit about already, his, his uh, areas of research include environmental philosophy, history, philosophy of science, mathematics, metaphysics, and the history of philosophy, the history and philosophy of culture. Uh, I'll mention just one of his uh, most recent books, The Philosophical Foundations of Ecological Civilization, a Manifesto for the Future, which was published in 2017. Today, uh, Professor Gare is going to talk to us uh, about mathematics, narratives, and life in an attempt uh, to reconcile science and the humanities. So he'll, he will speak for about 45 minutes. I'll have a couple of questions for him, and then we'll open it up to the larger group for discussion. All right. So uh, with that, uh, Aaron, I'll turn it over to you. Very much look forward to your remarks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me to make this presentation. Um, I was initially asked to talk on developments in mathematics, um, but uh, I was heavily involved in that about five years ago. And I'm not a mathematician. It's difficult to give a lecture if you're not a mathematician about advanced ideas in maths. Um, <clears throat> so um, I suggested that I talk about something I've been engaged in more recently, and it's really associated with um, the development of biosemiotics and the effort to give a place to both mathematics and narratives. And this is seen by me as part of that broader project of making process philosophy, you know, the philosophy of civilization succeeding in the struggle against um, <clears throat> you know, the nihilists. Um, and uh, the work that I'm engaged in is also an effort to integrate ideas from various process philosophers, particularly Peirce and Whitehead, um, but going back to Schelling and arguing that he has to be recognised as a, a major figure in the development of modern process metaphysics. You can trace most of the process philosophers back to him, somebody who's generally ignored because he's regarded as a romantic, and the romantics were people who, who thought to have their hearts in the right place, but a bit soft-headed. Uh, well, he wasn't like that. Um, but the, the work in um, theoretical biology is also a way of um, uniting these ideas in a very practical way. That is that, um, you know, I'll be looking at the ideas of, referring to the ideas of Wellington, who is very strongly influenced by Whitehead um, in the development of his theoretical, theoretical biology and the whole theoretical biology movement that he helped inspire, um, <clears throat> leading to major conferences in the late uh, 1960s and early 1970s. And what I want to do is show the need to integrate those ideas of Waddington's with the ideas of the biosemiotics, biosemioticians, particularly those influenced by Peirce. And that's a way of integrating the ideas of Peirce and Whitehead. <clears throat> so um, I think you need to keep that in mind and um, what I say and what I'm talking about. Uh, so it's partly a, an effort also in the process to rethink the history of process metaphysics. Um, and from my point of view, that's extremely important. And it's also illustrating the importance of narratives, stories, um, not to be taken as just sort of entertainment, but as central to orienting ourselves to um, understanding the past and creating the future. <clears throat> and the way you tell these stories, um, to some extent determines whether or not you're going to be successful. So you know, one of the most influential works of Whitehead is Science in the Modern World, where he told a story about you know, the development of science, situating his own work in relationship to that. And it's that perspective provided by history that um, I think uh, convinced huge numbers of people, people who you know, didn't have any uh, contact with process philosophers to embrace his work and embrace the need to um, um, you know, sort of forward these ideas. 
Um, so to some extent, you know, what I'll be doing in this is um, refiguring that narrative. Now, the um, <clears throat> starting point is the um, scientific materialism, which um, White had defined as what has to be overcome. Um, uh, <clears throat> Ronnie Dersmet has suggested that the problem now is not so much scientific materialism, but Pythagoreanism. And if you look at the development of scientific materialism, it was associated with new developments in mathematics, analytic geometry of Descartes, um, the calculus developed by Newton and so on. <clears throat> and uh, the development of the notion of matter as inert bits of um, you know, atoms moving endlessly, meaninglessly, as um, White had characterized it, or points, as um, Descartes talked about, um, really derive from the mathematics. And this is what I think has to be understood. Um, now, the thing about that development was it was enormously successful. And the only way you're going to um, succeed in process philosophy is doing justice to the achievements of mathematics. <clears throat> and also, um, on that basis, recognizing the potential of developing better mathematics, mathematics that's more in accordance with the process view of the world. Um, so, um, looking at you know that that earlier history that's divided by um, Whitehead, um, it focuses on the 17th century. If you move to the 19th and 20th centuries, you can see that you know, scientific materialism um, really um, was led by um, Darwinians. Um, and the concept of life, I think, has to be recognized as really central to, um, to all this, because it's, um, you know, if you look at the Cartesian dualism, um, you don't get very far just looking at consciousness and then looking at its relationship to the physical world. It's with life that you've got that, that bridge. And so I think that that has to be the focus of um, understanding the opposition between you know, the dominant Pythagoreanism and people promoting a process view of the world. You know, what you had with the development of Darwinian evolutionary theory was the development of neo-Darwinism, which tried to make it more scientific and in the process really much more mechanistic. And as it's developed, it's incorporated information, the notion of information. So DNA is supposed to encode information and we're supposed to be machines for reproducing DNA. And I think that the, um, the development of information science has been really problematic for process philosophers because it's enabled the proponents of this reductionist uh, Pythagoreanism to gain a new lease of life by claiming to, now they've got the means to characterize life and thought. <clears throat> Supposedly, cognition can be characterized as receiving and processing information. Um, and you had the development of cybernetics. Um, <clears throat> so we can be conceived of as information processing cyborgs. Um, <clears throat> we've now got people, post-humanists, arguing that um, uh, it's elitist to regard ourselves as superior to these, um, to robots as they develop, which might become more efficient at processing information. And we should just accept that we'll be succeeded by these more efficient information processes. Um, <clears throat> But that's also associated with the um, development of scientism. You know, the success of that whole development has been associated with the undermining of the humanities. Um, <clears throat> so it's regarded as you know, part of the entertainment industry. And it's clear that um, you know, the humanities areas of universities are now really looked down upon. They've lost in that struggle with two cultures. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> that's something that has to be really struggled against. Um, now, that's where we're also looking at the history of um, the development of scientific materialism. Um, Whitehead, um, like most people, regarded the 17th century scientific revolution as overcoming or leaving behind the medieval worldview. Um, what people like Stephen Toulmin pointed out was that it wasn't so much the um, medieval worldview, medieval <clears throat> order that was being reacted to against by people like Descartes and Newton and so on, but the Florentine Renaissance. Um, and it was the Florentine Renaissance that engendered the humanities, uh, you know, Petrarch developing a new form of education, 
uh, reviving ideas of the Roman Republicans and ancient Greeks committed to uh, republicanism, a, a form of democratic republicanism. And <clears throat> um, from the perspective of people like Descartes, it just led to chaos. Um, so they, if they supported anyone, it was the um, Venetians who had a society based on commerce, even though they purported to be a republic. Um, <clears throat> and you can see this with um, Hobbes further developing that mechanical view of the world. And I think probably being the most important figure for characterizing society. And you can see in Hobbes's work, a virtual anticipation of the idea that all thinking is just adding and subtracting. In other words, pretty much uh, processing information. Um, the other, um, um, I suppose, defect in Whitehead's characterizing of history, he gives a place to the romantics, but as I said, I don't think that he fully appreciated just how powerful the ideas of the romantics were and the extent to which his own thinking was really a development of their ideas. So <clears throat> um, what you've got is this Pythagoreanism that um, uh, sort of in integrates into it a kind of logical atomism where the logical atom is now bits of information. So John Wheeler argued that we what we take to be things or its are a construction from bits of information. And you know that really supports the block universe if you read John Wheeler's work. Um, and it supports you know, the idea that uh, uh, we've now, um, <clears throat> with the notion of information, got the basis for a coherent scientific worldview that's got no place for the humanities. And by virtue of that, has really got no place for what the humanities stood for. Well, the other side of the, um, the other development of the humanities, which culminated, I mean, the, the um, uh, Florentine Renaissance culminated, I think, in the work of uh, Guidano Bruno, which was nature enthusiasm, which is really a form of process philosophy. And also Vico is a culmination of, um, you know, work on history. Um, the Renaissance was concerned particularly with reviving history as it had been defended or developed in Rome, but also in the ancient Greeks. And so history is the core of the humanities is something that you have to take really seriously. And this is where you, you get the conflict between you know, the humanities and scientism really coming out into the open, or one area where it comes out into the open, the other areas, as I said, is I think the um, uh, struggle within biology over how you characterize what life is. Now, <clears throat> that's a you know, very schematic sort of history um, um, of development of um, scientism. But the thing about narratives is that they're capable of being schematic. In fact, they have to be. You know, if you write history, you always have to leave certain things out. But I think that um, what it does is show how, you know, the Pythagoreanism um, culminates in a Parmenidian view of the world. And this is what Nietzsche, as somebody who was um, influenced by the Romantics, pointed out. Um, it's associated with the Egyptianism of Western philosophers. Um, <clears throat> and as he put it, there is their hatred of even the idea of becoming their Egyptianism. They think they're doing a thing honor when they dehistoricize it, subspecies atone, when they make a mummy of it. All that philosophers have handled for millennia have been conceptual mummies. Nothing actual has escaped their hands alive. They kill their stuff when they worship these conceptual idolaters. They become a mortal danger to everything when they worship. Death, change, age, as well as procreation and growth are for them objections, refutations even. What is does not become, what becomes is not. Now they believe even to the point of despair in that which is. Now he's normally regarded as somebody who was reacting against Christianity, but if you read his notebooks, it's clearly the development of science and Boltzmann's work. Um, <clears throat> Uh, advancing that mechanical view or atomistic view of the world that he is really concerned about. And he really is appalled at the um, um, labor of you know, these scientists producing a great edifice of concept, displaying the rigid regular regularity of a Roman columbarium, exciting, exciting the logic that, and strength and coolness, which is characteristic of mathematics. And a columbarium is where people would put the ashes of the dead. So it's a, the deadening effect of scientism 
and also in the philosophical notebooks, he talked about the aim of science is to destroy the world. I think that if you look at the trajectory that we've been on since then, uh, there's good evidence that this worldview, this, this culture continues, that's where we're going to end up. So um, looking at the, um, the development that took place after that, um, as I said, I think the thing that um, Whitehead left out didn't do justice to was the uh, romantic reaction. And what you really had was in Germany, um, a revival of um, Renaissance ideas and a further elaborating, elaboration of them. These ideas had been really suppressed after the rise of Newtonian physics and what have you. In Britain, you had a uh, few people promoting it. <clears throat> and in France, you had people like Rousseau and Diderot and so on promoting these ideas. But it was in Germany that these ideas got really developed. And the pivotal figure is clearly Kant, um, who's perhaps less, um, well, his main ideas are less radical than I think they should be. <clears throat> um, he just uh, started out embracing Vico's ideas that science and mathematics are human constructions and thereby putting humanity back in the center of the picture. And on that basis, being able to give a place to free agency, ethics and his political philosophy and so on. Um, <clears throat> But he was really a very deep thinker. And um, if you read his work, you realize that he was never somebody who came up with just a, a fixed system. He was continually developing his ideas. And this is how he was understand, understood at the time. <clears throat> um, for instance, he wasn't simply defending Newtonian physics. He was influenced by Broskovich and Leibniz, and so defended the notion of matter as active, um, even when he was sort of trying to limit the influence of scientism. Um, but it's also in the critique of judgment, he wrote some really important ideas on biology that had a huge influence on Schelling. Um, and he characterized these for the most part as principles of regulative reason rather than <clears throat> the more basic ideas of um, uh, reason, because he thought that ultimately you might be able to um, justify these ideas mechanistically. But he also, um, in one place, suggested that this is more basic than what you get in the physical sciences. And I think that, you know, one of the interesting things about the mechanical view of the world, Whitehead didn't use that term, I think, for good reason. The machine always implies organization for a purpose. And this is something that Michael Polanyi really brought out very clearly. And if you're studying a machine, you're never going to understand it if you look at its chemistry and what have you. You have to understand what its purpose is. You have to have life as something more than a machine in order to understand what a machine is. Um, so I think that that's what um, Schelling took from um, Kant and <clears throat> really developed. Now, Kant um, influenced a number of thinkers, and for the most part, these people. Um, gave up on the numeral realm and defended a form of um, idealism. You get that in Fichte and then in Hegel. And Schelling is usually lumped together with Fichte and Hegel as um, somewhere in between the two. But in fact, Schelling, when you read him, argues that natural philosophy is more fundamental than the work of the idealists, where they're examining the categories that people must use in order to understand the world. And what he did was naturalize the um, transcendental argument, um, saying that if um, science is possible, nature must be something different than it was characterized by people like Newton and Descartes. You have to fundamentally reconceive nature. And he built on that notion of nature being active and Kant's ideas about biology to really defend a process view of the world. Um, and that, that fundamental um, argument, I think, should be recognized as the core of process philosophy. You know, science requires people who are conscious, who can develop science um, <clears throat> as part of nature. And you have to understand nature um, as such that allows that development to take place. You know, like there's that kind of being to emerge from nature. Um, this is where I think, you know, the 
the people who are promoting us, the idea of us as information processing cyborgs is a real challenge that has to be combated. Um, you know, they're <clears throat> acknowledging the need for understanding us. And you get this with you know, crude versions of um, uh, Darwinian epistemology. Um, and this idea that ideas, the ones that went out in the struggle for survival, and they're just really forms of information and means of uh, organizing your information. Um, I think that <clears throat> you have to recognize that that just doesn't do justice to what science is. You know, it's associated with understanding and awareness and consciousness and so on. And that requires a far more fundamental recharacterization of the nature of physical existence. Um, <clears throat> but the, the crucial place is um, that of biology, looking at what life is and characterizing life. And that, that's what um, Schelling was doing. Now, <clears throat> in doing that, um, calling for a new philosophical physics, he also suggested that we need a new mathematics. And I think that this is um, you know, a really bold move. Um, think about someone like Hegel, you know, wrote huge amounts on natural philosophy that had no influence. Schelling actually had a huge influence on the subsequent development of the sciences and on mathematics. People took up his ideas um, <clears throat> and further developed them. I won't talk so much about his ideas about physical existence, but his, which are very similar in some ways to, to Whitehead's, but the ideas about mathematics. Um, he argued that we needed um, sort of, um, dynamic mathematics. Um, a new form of, of mathematics appropriate for a dynamic universe. Um, and this inspired well, Schleiermacher, supported this also, um, and Justice Grossman was influenced by both Schleiermacher and Schelling um, to develop a fluid geometry, a dynamist morphogenetic mathematics that would facilitate insight into the emergence and inner synthesis of patterns in nature. That's how it was characterized by Heuser. Um, and that's um, that was a you know, successful development of mathematics that enabled him to model crystallization. Now, his um, least intelligent son, Norman Grassman, who he thought didn't have much potential, um, took up his ideas and developed a whole new approach to mathematics called extension theory which he presented as a survey of a general theory of forms, assuming, as he put it, only the most, the, the general concepts of equality and difference, conjunction and separation. Um, it was meant as the keystone of the entire structure of mathematics. Um, <clears throat> if people have read David Baum on his notion of order, those um, um, differences and similarities, similarities, similar differences and so on, um, he actually was studying Grassmann when he developed these ideas. So you can see the source of that notion of order in Grassmann's work. But Grassmann, um, <clears throat> even though he was largely ignored at the time, um, actually provided the foundation for most of the new forms of mathematics that have been deployed in physics. Um, he was an inventor of linear and multilinear algebra, uh, and the precursor of vector algebra, exterior algebra, and Clifford algebra. Uh, Clifford was strongly influenced by him. And uh, Whitehead, his first major published work, I think, was Universal Algebra, strongly influenced by Grassmann. Um, later on, other thinkers, Heaviside and Gibbs, um, developed ideas um, that really echoed his work without having read his work, but he anticipated those developments. And <laughs> even the developments of um, um, Hence, calculus was to um, some extent uh, influenced by Grassmann's mathematics. Um, <clears throat> now, William Lazare um, argues that Grassmann, Grassmann's extension theory was also a precursor to category theory, which is a more recent development in mathematics that I'll talk about later on. But it's, I think, fairly important to understand all those developments in relationship to each other. So a very powerful tradition. So what you know, process philosophy should be appreciated as a much more powerful tradition of thought than it's normally understood to be. 
you know, people look at Bergson and Peirce and so on, and various other figures, perhaps um, um, the uh, already in um, <clears throat> Russia, for instance, um, the idea of technology, um, which led, led to the development of systems theory. Um, these are also part of that whole tradition of thought. But the thing is, they should be recognized as part of a, a developing tradition, which has diversity of approaches within it. But that's characteristic of a healthy tradition. You need diversity for it to succeed. <clears throat> well, not losing the plot and losing the core commitment to understanding the world as process. Um, now, Whitehead um, is usually associated with Bertrand Russell as trying to reduce mathematics to logic. But um, I think that he was um, uh, doing far more than that and really had a very different understanding of mathematics to um, Bertrand Russell. Um, he characterized it as um, the science of patterns, but um, if you look at what he wrote about it in various places, um, you know, rejecting the idea that mathematics is just a set of tautologies, he wrote that <clears throat> when we say the equal sign of two times three is six, implies that it's a tautology. Um, <clears throat> he argued that you should read that as two threes are becoming six. Um, so it's got a process orientation to it. And you could argue that what he was really talking about is patterning rather than patterns. Now the patterns are you know, what you investigate as the realm of possibilities, you know, the eternal objects and uh, process and reality. Um, <clears throat> but um, I think it's better to characterize these as you know, the realm of possibilities and recognizing the reality of possibilities and the need to study those and then look at how those possibilities are actualized um, <clears throat> as a kind of process. So that, that's the core of his whole thinking, I think. Um, along with this, this commitment to doing justice to all dimensions of our experience and recognizing that science only reveals some of those some of the patterns of activity that exist in reality. He also defended the you know, classical education, the humanities, and as I say, I've read uh, brilliant histories of, of science and civilization. Um, <clears throat> um, it's interesting you know, reading his characterization of science, how similar it is to Schelling's. It also anticipates most of the developments of the post logical positivist philosophers of science, you know, people like Kuhn, who was probably indirectly influenced by Whitehead, um, Lakatos with his notion of hard cause that you commit yourself to and what have you. Um, so again, it's really important to recognize the continuities of this tradition, which tends to get blocked out. And I think it gets blocked out. You know, <clears throat> people gain positions and then don't allow when their students don't get um, academic positions. So there's a kind of tendency for the continuity of this, these traditions to be um, lost sight of. Um, <clears throat> now, looking at the influence of uh, Whitehead on science, um, you know, his famous for his effort to develop an alternative general theory of relativity. But I think that the more interesting work perhaps is, or it was like a you know, physicist influence by him, but the, what tends to be overlooked, perhaps it's because this was taking place in Britain rather than in America, is the development of theoretical biology and the importance of people like um, Waddington and um, his colleagues in developing the theoretical biology movement. Um, they're influenced by other thinkers as well. Um, the notion of field was taken up and developed from um, Alexander Gervich, a Lithuanian Russian um, sort of biologist influenced um, <clears throat> um, influenced by other thinkers, and influenced also by Wolfgang um, um, Bertel Amphi, who also took up the notion of field. But the <clears throat> Waddington was particularly influenced by Whitehead in his characterization of these fields and how they developed. He 
wrote on Whitehead and criticised him for being too complex. He produced simplistic ideas, perhaps, but I think that he was taking over those ideas which you could utilise, not worrying about whether or not he was being faithful to Whitehead. So developing the notion of concrete, uh, of um, uh, canalised paths of development was, as he, as he himself pointed out, strongly influenced by Whitehead. Um, now, you don't normally think of concrescence in relationship to societies of actual occasions because there's a strong tendency to treat that as appropriate to understanding you know, the actual occasions, and often that's understood very atomistically. But then, you know, the compound individual has been a problem for Whiteheadians, and Whitehead himself said he'd been misunderstood in that regard in a letter to Hartshorn. Um, so I think that there's justification for that appropriation of the notion of concrescence and characterizing the development of fields as canalized path as development understood as a kind of concrescence in interaction of these fields with their surrounding environment. Um, <clears throat> now the other aspect of his work on those fields was appreciating how they emerge from each other. So if you look at embryology, you can see how from a you know, a couple of cells, you get that differentiation and um, in the process, um, subfields emerging. So you get the field of, you know, the wall limb and the hind limb and then the sub subfields of you know, the digits and what have you. <clears throat> and so that, that engendered a um, whole research project in biology, developed particularly by Brian Goodwin. Um, it was associated with, as I said, the notion of creods as necessary path, homeoresis, the tendency once a path is disturbed to return to its original state, but also the examination of how paths could move from, I mean, the path could be displaced so that it led to a different path being taken. And these are the ideas that influenced um, René Tom in the development of his catastrophe theory, <clears throat> which he um, acknowledged rather than graciously, but um, I think it's clear that you know um, what you got, got there was a similar kind of development that had taken place when Faraday's work, which was uninfluenced by mathematics, was taken up and developed by Maxwell, who was a mathematician and could develop these ideas much more rigorously. Um, so another example of mathematics emerging from the process view of the world is that development of uh, <clears throat> of catastrophe theory, uh, Goodwin was looking at a different aspect of his work, the development of um, different temporalities, you know, the temporal organization of cells, and looked at um, uh, statistical mechanics. Um, very, um, the centrality of biochemical feedback loops in living processes, but also the oscillations that develop in those and how those relate to each other, um, which was um, looking at how you get complex coordination in multicelled organisms. Um, that notion of different temporalities, I think, is really important. It was something that was argued for by um, Bergson and uh, taken up and developed by Milik Chopek. Um, it tends to get forgotten about, but I think it's also been revived by the hierarchy theorists, people influenced by Howard Putty. And I think that it's an important component of the process philosophy that should be taken fairly seriously. Um, <clears throat> the whole project of theoretical biology um, inspired different developments. Um, participants included Stuart Kaufman, um, David Baum, um, um, somebody called Imbrel, who also looked at different temporalities, a whole range of thinkers. And um, Waddington linked up with um, Ilya Prigogine in his last years. And <clears throat> uh, Prigogine's work, to some extent, was influenced by the effort to develop that theoretical biology and the way he characterized the development of a slime mold and how the individual cells integrate into a, um, a multi-celled organism using fluctuations in chemical acrosin to orient themselves 
So it's pretty pretty much a development of that whole research program. And the, the notion of um, disciplinary structures, I think, you know, is a development of process thinking. Um, and it's interesting in the way in which Prigogine also was critical of the idea that you could fully characterize reality through mathematics. And there's a major argument with Rene Thoma over that issue. Um, <clears throat> the other development, as I said, was hierarchy theory developed by Patti, was also a participant in the conferences, were later taken up in ecology in particular by Timothy Allen, and then later on by Stan Salter, who provided a kind of bridge between this theoretical biology movement in Britain and the biosemioticians. Um, my person who wasn't invited to the conference, apparently because um, um, Richard Lewontin claimed that it was too far from the data was Robert Rosen. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Robert Rosen, I think, was primarily a mathematician initially, but concerned mainly to develop mathematics appropriate to life. And working in Chicago, he embraced and developed category theory. And I think it's unfortunate, you know, that category theory wasn't taken up at the time in the 1970s. Um, it originated in the work of Saunders MacLean, um, trying to investigate whether and when different branches of mathematics were dealing with the same objects. Uh, it was seen as a way of modeling one branch of math mathematics by another, um, and then developed into a general theory of mathematics by William Lovea as a challenge to, um, <clears throat> to set theory as the foundation of mathematics. But I think that it really provided a better defense of Whitehead's notion that science, I mean, mathematics is the science of the study of patterns. Um, Rosen, who took up these ideas um, and embraced um, Lavoie's arguments, um, characterized category theory as the general theory of formal modeling, the comparison of different modes of inferential or entailment structures. Moreover, it is a stratified or hierarchical structure without limit. The last level, which is familiarly understood by category theory, is a comparison of different kinds of entailment in different formalisms. The next level is roughly the comparison of comparisons. The next level is the comparison of these and so on. Um, so it facilitates an examination of relations to relations. So Rosen was concerned to characterize life mathematically, as I said, and what he argued was um, what he started looking at the nature of modeling generally in science and in mathematics and breaking with um, Saunders MacLean suggested that uh, just as you can model different branches of mathematics, you can model um, physical reality through your mathematics and the entailment structures in the mathematics will be those that are associated with the causal entailments in what you're examining. <clears throat> Looking at life, he argued that the peculiarity of it was that um, following von Neumann, um, organisms have models themselves. This is the condition of them being able to repair um, <clears throat> damage to them. Um, and once they can repair damage to them, they can also reproduce themselves. So these are the MR models. Um, to allow for the possibility of that, you have to allow for circular definitions um, and impredictivities in mathematics, which have previously been excluded. But by virtue of allowing those impredictivities, then it becomes impossible to sim simulate the um, causal entailments on a computer. Um, and he argued that this is because you're dealing with life, life itself, <clears throat> something that's much more than just mechanisms. Anything that's a mechanism can be modeled on a computer, living beings can't. Um, he emphasized that um, you know, life is really emergent. Um, and the um, when he talks about model, it's not as though you've got some kind of map somewhere. Um, it's a function of the whole organism um, <clears throat> in, in its environment. Um, when I talked to Stuart Kaufman about this notion, he was very uh, critical of it um, because I think that he understood it in a fairly limited way. 
but I think that you need to take seriously this idea that um, it's not the, um, um, as you put it, the um, fractionated components that you're examining. It's the functions. He's re reintroducing through mathematics the notion of there being functions and associated with that um, final causes. And this was associated with this development of um, um, you know, systems that anticipate the future and respond to what they anticipate, anticipatory, anticipatory systems. Um, now, the movement to develop um, theoretical, I mean, yeah, theoretical, I mean, philosophical, rather, biological mathematics, biomass, as it came to be called by. Um, uh, <clears throat> Semenov, Plemen Semenov, and Andre Erisman, um, they took their point of departure in Wazen's work and um, tried to further elaborate that notion of um, um, or modeling, um, but um, <clears throat> through category theory. Um, now, Kaufman, um, as I said, was rather critical of Rosen and didn't fully go along with the idea that you can model mathematically all the relations in living beings. And he came to this conclusion quite suddenly, um, writing it up in a book, Investigations, published in 2000, because it really broke with what he'd previously believed. He was a radical thinker developing um, <clears throat> the whole idea of, um, um, what's he call them? The <clears throat> order cat catalytic sets and developing new ideas, you know, being at the forefront of complexity theory. He came to the conclusion that he'd been dominated by um, a set of assumptions about what science is that came from Newton developed by Einstein and Bohr, which had to be questioned. And that is that through mathematics, you can pre-state all the possibilities. He said that when you look at what actually goes on in evolution, this isn't possible. There are adjacent possibles that are totally unable to be represented through your mathematical models. So he gave an example of what's involved in that. For instance, if you um, even say so fish, short of oxygen, starts gulping air, um, and that gulped air allowed the organism to take in oxygen, so from its float tanks, uh, float bladders. Um, a whole new development of evolution takes place, but it's not something that you could anticipate. You can't represent it prior to that having taken place. Um, if you look at um, what he called it, or what Darwin characterizes it, acceptations, developments that um, <clears throat> uh, end up having a useful function but didn't have a function until they were developed, you can only understand it through these um, uh, adjacent possibilities being taken up. And when you look at the interaction between organisms and in evolution and the way in which new situations are thrown up by their interactions, you can see that there's co-evolution where new possibilities are addressed in creative ways it can't be modeled mathematically. So even the very radical ideas in biomathematics um, developed by Rosen are not adequate to do justice to life itself. Um, it's on this basis that he started taking more interest in both Whitehead, and he turned up to one of the Whitehead and conferences that I was at, um, and also biosemiotics um, and, and met. Levi Carl, one of the main figures in development of biosemiotics in Estonia, um, and was convinced that we needed to move beyond mathematics to semiotics. That doesn't, doesn't mean to say you abandon mathematics, you just recognize its limitations. It's this recognition of the limitations, I think, that's fairly important, and why it is necessary to embrace um, biosemiotics. In the case of um, Danish thinkers, there are principally influenced by the work of Peirce in developing biosemiotics, but um, also 
Jacob von Oskol. And Jacob von Oskol was you know, a huge influence in Estonia, where he was born. So Kalevi Colors in Estonia really pushed um, Jacob von Oskol's work. I, I think most of you would know about Jacob von Oskol and how he argued that to understand an organism, you have to understand how it defines its environment as its world to which it then responds. So the world has uh, meaning for it. Um, these are the ideas that got taken up and developed in hermeneutic phenomenology by people like Heidegger, pointing out that we've also, in the case of humans, got uh, mid myth with worlds or Mitbelden and Eigenbelden, the self world that you achieve through reflection. Um, <clears throat> but the notion of the surrounding world um, was also the core of efforts to naturalize phenomenology. So it's um, a core idea of this more humanistic approach um, to understanding what life is. Um, what Perth provided was um, a way of rigorously characterizing what was involved in you know, the transformation or the, the defining of elements in your environment as signs, um, equating the notion of that meaningful world as a world of signs that you then respond to, the organism's response to. Um, <clears throat> Peirce had been, well, like Whitehead, a um, mathematician, a uh, major figure in the development of symbolic logic, uh, steeped in the history of philosophy. Um, but he characterized himself to William James as a Schellinian of some stripe. And like Whitehead being influenced by idealism, defended a kind of realism, which is confusing, but that's how it is. Um, he defended um, metaphysics and I get the basic categories of firstness, secondness, and thirdness. It was actually influenced by dialectical thinking. Um, and he argued that the aporias of most thought based on dualisms are by virtue of always thinking in dyads rather than triads. So, <clears throat> Um, in characterizing logic, he argued that there's not only deduction and induction, but also abduction, which is the creative component where um, people um, conjecture to make sense of what they experience or to overcome contradictions in their previous ideas, um, using Kepler as an example, somebody looking at the observations of Tycho Brahe and coming to the conclusion that you could account for these observations, if you saw the sun as the uh, center of the solar system and the orbits being elliptical rather than circular. Um, <clears throat> that had a, a big influence on later development of philosophy of science in possible. Um, Nord Russell Hansen, patterns of discovery. Um, <clears throat> but it's, um, the ideas were taken up beyond that and Perth himself um, suggested that a huge amounts, huge areas of what we understand about the world could be understood through um, um, his logic, which he then characterized as semiotics. Um, <clears throat> so semiosis was characterized triadically as involving a sign, an object, and an, and an interpretant. And that being triadic allows for a continual further development as each interpretant becomes a sign for further efforts to understand the object. Um, person literally understood um, what's involved in interpretants being ideas of the mind, but later on provided a much more general, definite, general definition as that which mediates between an object and an interpretant, since it is both determined by the object relatively to the interpretant and inter inter determines the interpretant in reference to the object in such wise as to cause the interpretant to be determined by the object through the mediation of the sign. So it's a long definition, but if you understand it, you can see that it's essentially a process in nature involving a very complex form of causation. And that's very much in accordance with Schelling's thinking. Um, so it's on that basis that the um, biosemioticians could take up versus work and rethink um, Jacob von Uxkull's ideas, but in doing so, they also extended it far further versus suggestions, arguing that um, the interpretant 
could not just be um, a symbol, an idea, but could be an action. So you think about you know, an organism interpreting its situation, the action being an interpreter, which also becomes an, a sign for other organisms or for itself. Not only that, you can also have vegetative semiosis where the generation of form can be seen as an interpretant. So a plant developing in a certain way is really um, an interpretant um, that is you know, growing towards light and towards the ground. And then you've got endosemiosis examining the communication that takes place within the organism and interpreting what's, a, what's involved in uh, <clears throat> um, you know, DNA um, being a sign vehicle. And didn't you, I mean, the biosemioticians use the term sign vehicle. Um, person himself didn't. But anyway, um, <clears throat> they analysed this and in the process were highly critical of the idea that you could, particularly Hofmeier, you could characterise this as you know, DNA just encoding information. Um, it's something that involves interpret an interpretant um, <clears throat> and uh, the notion of information that was acceptable to Hofmeier was um, Gregory Bateson's notion of a difference that makes a difference. It was always understood in relationship to the whole organism. So it's a much more holistic approach than you get in the information scientists. And Aaron, uh, just a quick time check for you. We're at about a little bit, a little bit over 45 minutes. So, um, okay. Yeah. Well, I'm pretty close to ending anyway. Great. Um, so the, um, <clears throat> the reverse. Um, ideas taken up by the biosemioticians. They embraced Putty's work on constraints, talking about semiotic constraints and characterizing emergence and semiotic scaffolding leading to new, more complex levels of organization on that basis. Um, the, um, the reactions to it, though, within the movement, some of them wanting to become more uh, acceptable to mainstream science and more happier to embrace the notion of information and focus on codes. Others more radical calling for biohermeneutics influenced by Heidegger and Gadana. Um, now, um, my view is that the, um, uh, they need to be both more acceptable to science, mainstream science, and need to embrace the insights of the biohermeneutics. In fact, the biohermeneuticists, in my view, weren't radical enough because they didn't really um, give a place to um, narratives in the development of life. Supposing you think about I mean, one, of the, one of the peculiar features of um, you know, logicians, they focus on propositions pretty much in isolation. <clears throat> the um, people reacting against logical positivism you know, pointed out the absurdity of that. You propose questions always formulated from the perspective of a theoretical framework, which itself can be an answer to a broader question. So <clears throat> the different propositions are related to each other. And you can say the same thing about science. You know, Peirce, because he was a magician, defined particular act of semiosis. And it's unfortunate that the plural of semiosis is the same as the singular. Um, you know, Chinese might be happy with that. But, um, <clears throat> It means that you can't talk about them easily. But if you think about what's involved in the semiosis in organisms, you can see that you know the development of um, the, the complex organism in epigenesis is a, pro a process of responding to a whole range of signs. The way I tried to illuminate it was looking at what's involved in the way <clears throat> builders in the Middle Ages built cathedrals, which often took centuries so over the life, individual lifetimes were just you know, superseded by the development of the cathedral <clears throat> the people participating in the development didn't have a, a rigid plan they responded to what was going on around them new developments in how you build things that kind of thing and they were responding particularly to the signs around them <clears throat> so the, um, <clears throat> the signs had meaning to them by virtue of their engagement in this much broader project now, if you understand um, you know, what's involved in that, it's really living out a story of building the cathedral. And what I've been suggesting is that you can see the same thing involved in 
the development of an organism, the endosymiosis, um, which is connected to um, the symiosis, as the funnel school talked about, you know, the surrounding world, <clears throat> um, being responses to situations where the particular instances of semiosis are part of the broader narrative. Um, <clears throat> and the, the importance of narratives in life was pointed out by um, uh, Stuart McIntyre and also David Carr, <clears throat> I think made a very strong case that um, we're always living out stories and that the stories we tell made sense of because we're living out stories and we can refigure those stories. But I'm, what I'm suggesting is that this is what's taking place within organisms, a kind of living out of the story. Now, trying to argue for that position um, <clears throat> seems to me that you, the Persian biosemeticians haven't done justice to the, um, you know, what's really going on. I mean, they haven't fully embraced um, the kind of ideas that were taken up by Waddington. And what you really need to do is synthesize the ideas of Waddington who called for something like biosemiotics right at the end of his four conferences and, and this um, person in biosemiotics. Um, and then you can see that the sign, you know, if you look at DNA, what, what is it? I mean, you know, information science talks about, you know, how you can get so much through a channel, um, <clears throat> through, um, you know, cable or whatever. Trying to characterize that in abstraction as information is like looking at a page of print on a paper and saying how many shapes you can sort of identify on the page. It's meaningless unless you see this as writing that has to be interpreted. It's only in relationship to it's being interpreted that it can be seen as information. And I think that this is a feature of science. The science always have to be understood in terms of the broader fields um, that, uh, um, <clears throat> that they're part of and they're associated with the you know switching from one path to another whatever you can see that this is um, <clears throat> where signs are really important and you can see how you know signs in the environment uh, for instance a particular sign of scent I, th I think it is of a horned grasshopper can lead to whole transformation of the morphogenesis of the grasshopper so that it develops into a locust rather than a grasshopper with every part of the grasshopper being slightly different than it would have been otherwise but you can see from that you know the creativity involved in that semiosis and the semiosis being involved with a whole lot of levels of different <clears throat> uh, instances of semiosis associated with the different uh, fields and subfields each of those fields having partial autonomy being constrained by their environment and constituents, but not being reducible to them, and relating that back to the notion of concrescence, you know, as an imminent causation. I think that's really important for also appreciating where, you know, the feeling that's so important to Whiteheadians has its place. You know, it's when you eliminate any appreciation of that imminent causation that the notion of something having a feeling becomes meaningless. But once you've got that in place, then it doesn't it's not all that difficult. And you know to appreciate that, and to appreciate that's connected to um, the signs having meaning. So <clears throat> um, this leads to um, you know defence of that notion of narrative, and the idea was that um, biosemioticians can give a place to mathematics and as a kind of semiosis, um, and the causal relationships that are associated with that, but also to that more creative side of things associated with narrative, and you can combine the two. <clears throat> and there has been efforts to develop a, um, um, a semiotic notion of mathematics based on purse and modeling by Marcel Denisi and Mariana Buk Bukarova, even though Purse himself didn't characterize mathematics through semiotics. And that links up with the work of, um, or utilize the work of people like Lakoff, on the role of metaphors and elaboration of metaphors in developing um, mathematics fitting Peirce's idea of diagrammatic reasoning. Um, <clears throat> so my work was so just saying well, that, that's great and that can um, allow the biosemeticians to appreciate 
providing that they integrate their ideas with Waddington's ideas developed by category theory. Um, and then at the same time, um, you can recognize this Persian approach to narratology as opposed to a structuralist or a hermeneutic phenomenologist approach, um, in my view, being superior to both those and giving a place to the insights of both of them. So that, that's what my work has been involved in, um, trying to make sense of that. And um, I'm not sure that I've been all that convincing. I gave a talk at the Biosemiotics Conference in last year in Czech Republic. Um, I'm not sure how it went down. I really feel that I've got a lot more work to do in this. Um, <clears throat> But uh, you know, that's, that's where it stands. And the idea is that with that synthesis of Waddington's theoretical trajectory and biosemioticians, you've got a synthesis of um, um, process philosophy, the Persian and the Whiteheadian process philosophy, drawing upon other ideas which are consistent with the Schellingian tradition. And it really does overcome that opposition between the humanities and the sciences by putting narratives right down in nature as part of life. That's it. Thank you so much, Aaron, both for the historical account of uh, the sort of stream of influences that some of us may not have known about and also for the theoretical proposals uh, to, to move the ball forward. Um, it strikes me that uh, in in Whitehead's own historical account, as as you note, um, in Science in the Modern World, he doesn't do justice to or wasn't aware of uh, the contributions that Schelling made uh, in the uh, early nineteenth, late eighteenth, early nineteenth century to the kind of process um, philosophy and and philosophy of nature that he himself uh, would take up in the twentieth century. Um, and your work is helping to correct that and um, carrying forward this uh, work of archaeology that 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 you're doing. I've also been trying to um, cement Schelling in in the lineage of process philosophy um, to point out the continuity there. I think it helps illuminate what Schelling was doing to compare him to Whitehead and vice versa. So there's so many so many questions I could ask you, and there's. There's a very active um, conversation in the chat uh, that hopefully I can draw from as well. I think my first question for you would be in regards to uh, Pythagoras and Pythagoreanism and the role that mathematics plays in metaphysics. Um, it seems to me that for Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans, there was not yet this sharp bifurcation between say the quantitative and the qualitative and that uh the pythagoreans obviously felt there was a very close connection between number and music for example yeah uh and the idea of ratio as a relationship um that in some sense was was a an aesthetic relationship a harmony as it were and that the meanings of numbers had to do with these types of relationships and it was not the kind of calculative quantitative form uh, of mathematics that uh, we might be more used to in the modern world. And so I wonder if there's anything salvageable in the Pythagorean tradition. I, well, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you have to salvage that because you have to appreciate just how important the development of mathematics was to our development of our understanding of the world. The problem is to uh, avoid that Parmenidian tendency. So Parmenides was really strongly influenced by Pythagoras. And if you think about uh, principles of sufficient reason, the conclusion he came to understanding the world through mathematics is there's just one. <laughs> it all, all change and difference and so on, or illusions. And Zeno defended that by pointing out the um, paradoxes when you do give a place to change, you know, you can't make sense of it. Um, you look at the atomists, and they were saying, okay, well, how can we have the appearance of change um, with Parmenides? So it's, what they said there's a whole lot of Parmenidean ones that move in relationship to each other. So you've got the atoms and the void. And Aristotle pointed out, you know, that 
the void is nothing, how can there be any different distance <laughs> and the incoherence of that? And you can trace, you know, all these developments. The introduction of the motion of space by Delizio was dealing with that problem that Aristotle had argued against the atomists by saying, well, actually they're located in space. So space has got an ontological status. And it all, all you know, brilliantly cohered in Newton's philosophy. And that's, an, you know, the problematic aspect of Newton's philosophy, that it was so coherent that it becomes really difficult to overcome. Mm. But then yeah. you know, Newton himself said that um, space was the sensorium of the deity and through which God was active. And so when Maxwell was looking at this defending field theory, he pointed out, well, Newton was really a field theorist. So it was a vulgarization of Newton that ended up coming to dominate. Yeah, I suppose I can see the line from Parmenides saying that being is to a view of mathematics as merely logical tautologies. Um, and that there's a there's a need to uh, resurrect, I think. Uh, I mean, in, in Whitehead's work, you get a more aesthetic sense of the mathematical realm as uh, not detached from aesthetics, uh, I think. And, and it's a very powerful um, tool, but I think we've allowed it to become the master, perhaps. And I hear you saying um, that semiotics can provide us with a, um, a, a sort of general language in terms of which both the humanities and the, the role of narrative, as well as um, mathematics, can begin to, to cohere and to be understood as descriptions of the same universe, yeah. uh, right? Yeah. Providing um, you overcome the limitations of the biosemitics by integrating it with the, um, you know, Waddington tradition. Sure. The notion of fields, I think, is really important. The notion of fields is really interesting because you know, in that whole debate about compound individuals, um, various people came up with solu proposed solutions. One of them, I think it was Joseph Early, argued that you needed to give a place to fields in what's involved in concrescence, you know, the concrescence involving the appreciation by the actual occasion of the field within which it's functioning. Um, and I think that uh, I found that pretty appealing. I mean, I haven't spent a lot of time working on it, but um, because Waddington just used the term field, it seems to me that that's a good thing to build upon. And it, it's lacking in, um, in person biosemiotics. And I think you've got the same problem that led um, Charles Hartshorn to move from Peirce to Whitehead. You know, he edited all Peirce's work and found it deficient. Well, you've got the same kind of deficiency, I think, in the biosemioticians. You need to incorporate that um, Whiteheadian development. But the notion of fields itself is, you know, really, um, or well, Ruth Kastner's here, so you can talk about that, um, you know, really complex notion. Um, and Ruth, along with um, Stuart Kaufman, you know, want to give a place to real possibilities, um, real potentialities um, as part of those fields, which I think is the right way to go. Mm. So just a few weeks ago at the 50th anniversary conference of the Center for Process Studies, there was a presentation by uh, Benjamin Chica on biosemiotics. And he offered it as a, a friendly challenge to pan experientialists uh, by arguing that, you know, we really shouldn't be trying to push experience all the way down, but rather recognize it as emerging at the level of life and that the biosemioticians give us a, a powerful way of, um, of understanding and, 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 and grappling with the role that experience as a kind of interpretation might play um, in the living world. Um, I've always understood Peirce to be like Whitehead, um, if not a pan-experientialist, at least a, a pan-semioticist <laughs> in the yeah, sense yeah. that sign interpretation goes all the way down. And so some kind of um, experience, if you want, I don't know if Peirce would use that exact word, uh, goes all the way down. And so when you think about, speaking of the limitations of the biosemiotic paradigm, um, do you think that there is... Um, any, is there something important being lost when we are un, unable to recognize that the physical, the pre-living or non-living physical world is also engaged in uh, activities of sign interpretation? And if that is the case, 
what does that mean about the the extent of experience in in the universe yeah um i think post talked about feeling rather than experience i think that somehow you have to get experience right at the beginning because um otherwise it, you just can't account for its emergence and that's where i was saying that um just the um imminent causation of fields and must imply some something like feeling you know holding the whole thing together um in a very proto way i like the word proto <laughs> i wish you to sort of minimize it and then talk about how it might develop um the um <clears throat> biosemeticians for the most part um, argued for biosemiotics being the, the beginning of semiosis I mean, life beginning of semiosis so some wanted to extend it through the entire cosmos Simon Brio I think wanted to do that uh, which was reacted to by others who regarded that as uh, <clears throat> leading people to dismiss it as unscientific um I've sort of um not really gone into it much um as far as Whitehead is concerned you know he was interpreted by some as a panpsychist and rejected the idea that he was a panpsychist so that's why people took up the notion of pan experientialism um I'm happy with the notion of feeling um and would like to think of experience as a you know more developed kind of feeling but I haven't really um gone into it much um living in an environment which is really hostile to these ideas I tend to you know take my stand on positions where I can most easily defend what I'm arguing for and then build out from there in the case of um Barbieri you know he's promoting code biology and fairly critical of Peirce um so the paper that I gave in Moscow in 2019 was an effort to defend person biosemiotics in a way that couldn't be dismissed as somehow unscientific by talking about the notion of causation so on that basis he argued he got me to write a paper for a um, special edition of the journal um by assistance then he later on asked me to write another paper and since I was working on narratives which is related to hermeneutics that was just too far for him <laughs> <laughs> my proposal um th th this is what you've got you know this this constant struggle and in promoting the notion of narrative I've decided to focus on the epigenesis of multicellular organisms because I think that's where his code biology proves to be limited he talks about codes as being a, a kind of con nat natural convention you know there's no necessary relationship between the DNA and the proteins that it's produced there has to be a kind of ribotype that kind of mechanism that transforms the the, you know the order you get in the DNA into the particular kind of proteins but a feature of multicellular organisms is clearly the ability of the organism as a whole to utilize DNA the same string of DNA to produce different proteins which you know sort of doesn't fit his um characterization of what's going on when I look you know read carefully his work it was clear that you know he's really weak in that area so that's what I've decided to focus on <laughs> mm yeah it's it's a difficult issue um because we both want to recognize and grant what is unique about living organisms that's mm. uh not present in the non-living world and yet we don't want to so emphasize that difference that it becomes impossible to understand how life could have come out of physics and chemistry and there are very few um approaches that get that balance right I think um, yeah I think it's really important to acknowledge that distinction between life and non-life because we're faced with you know wrecking the global ecosystem and I think that it's necessary to appreciate that the earth is better than Venus <laughs> some people regard that as sort of physically incorrect because it implies some kind of elitism <laughs> you know I'm really opposed to the um post-humanist but you know, I tend to take an ecocentric view um but then appreciating you know, the importance of different life forms as some more sentient than others um, and humans you know being cultural beings <clears throat> somehow um, having a unique status yeah so one last question for you um <clears throat> thinking more about the uh, domain of mind and consciousness there's a lot of talk a lot of concern uh, a lot of um almost hysteria right now about the new chat GPT um, AI 
uh, applications and um, some people uh, seem to me to be um, um, on the verge of claiming that these that these machines are already in a sense conscious and a lot of this has to do with the ambiguity of the term information as you were highlighting um, because no. if human beings are understood as if our own consciousness is understood as just a kind of complicated information processing then um, there's no real huge hurdle for uh, algorithms to leap in order to become just like we are um, and you know personally I'm less concerned about machines becoming conscious than I am about human beings who think that machines are conscious. Yeah. Um, hmm. And so yeah. I wonder what 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 would you want to um, bring into this conversation that's so topical right now? Well, the, the, what I said right at the beginning, you know, this effort to add information, looking at us as information processing cyborgs as being the, the prime thing that has to be overcome. So that's just part of that whole worldview associated with post-humanism, the idea that we should replace humans with machines. Um, Dmitry Orloff in his book on um, shrinking the technosphere had a brilliant piece on you know this kind of thinking how um, parents would first of all or, or people as they got sick would sort of um, cut off their heads and have um, cyborgs, better organized cybernetic <laughs> bodies than later on they'd decide that they could download their brains onto computers and they would do away with the thing entirely and they'd have children first of all they'd have children and cut off their heads to begin with to make life easier and attach them to computers and then later on they'd say oh, well you know the head's a bit problematic we'll just have a computer <laughs> 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 you know, like, you know, the stupidity of it <laughs> um i think you know people like rosin are important for showing what's wrong with that way of thinking you know that there's a kind of life itself that just isn't computable in that way. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it seems to me that while machines are becoming uh, more and more capable at mimicking human language, human beings are becoming more and more machine-like uh, in our in our communications. And so uh, it's as though we're meeting. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a problem. Well, I mean, first talked about this. You know, talked about when you. He said that, you know, begin, you've got mind, you know, there's this feeling and so on, and it's all spontaneity and possibilities, and then it gets habits. And when the habits become absolute, then you've got matter. And you can see that people are transforming themselves from minds to matter and becoming, yeah. you know, th this is associated with managerialism, you know, controlling people so that they become pre predictable cogs in the machine. Then you can replace them with machines. Right. <laughs> 